Hey everyone, I'm Adam Leventhal. I work at uh, Delphix as a software engineer. Um, and I'm going to be speaking today about hybrid storage pools, which is something I worked on many years ago in the context of ZFS and Fishworks. Um, but now we get the benefit of hindsight to assess kind of how these things went. Uh, so when I've spoken in the past and when people have written in the past, I think it's been um, with kind of rose-colored lenses that we've looked at this. Um, I spoke yesterday at the Lumos talk and, and afterwards uh, Matt Aarons, who's hosting us today, said, Adam, you seemed really sedate for that talk. Um, so I'm really sick, and I was really sick yesterday, so I'll try to compensate by swearing more. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so um, I wanted to talk about the, the heady days of Flash, which we're now in the middle of. Um, and, you know, Flash, people think it was this new thing, but it was in fact invented in the 80s. Um, there's a, the process of Flash internally that reminded the inventor of a flash bulb on a camera as it kind of cleared a big uh, block of flash. That's where the name comes from. Um, it's characterized by very, very fast reads in the order of 50 microseconds and pretty fast writes, um, you know, 300 microseconds. And these numbers kind of vary depending on the lithography and the type of the NAND and so forth. But these are good back of the envelope numbers. So very high IOPS, very low latency, uh, and a limited number of write erase cycles. So 2004, Flash cost just as much as DRAM. Uh, by 2007, when I, I started working with Flash, it was right between um, DRAM and disk in terms of its dollars per gigabyte. Um, everyone know what happened in between? Right? Yes, exactly. The things that are in all of our pockets and in all of your children's pockets and so forth. Um, it, it, you know, that's the explosion of Flash-based devices, which really dramatically changed the economics. So. Um, you know, 2007, 2008, people were saying, disk is dead, and it's dead just like tape is dead. Everyone's been hearing tape is dead. Um, but uh, I think everyone still has disks in their data center here. Some people don't, um, I guess, or they're just chuckling. Um, but the, the death of, of uh, disks have been, has been widely overreported, just like the, the death of tape. Um, we do have these all-flash solutions. So anyone running an all-flash solution? Your laptop does not count? A right. <laughs> couple, couple of folks are. I mean, I own my laptop, and you guys all should too, because it's awesome. Um, and get your employer to buy you and tell them it's going to make you much more productive. Um, but, uh, but these flash, these all flash solutions, people love them, and they, they tried them out. Um, but they're very expensive. The dollars per gigabyte are tough to are still tough to make it work out, um, even though it's become much less expensive. So, in around 2007, um, this is uh, in the context of the ZFS-based storage appliance, the first such appliance. Um, we were working on in the, in the uh, Fishworks group at Sun. And the goal, of course, of ZFS and of that appliance was to make enterprise class storage out of these commodity components. Um, the problem was the enterprise class storage was a lot faster than the crap we were putting together. Um, so we were looking at, at ways of accelerating it um, to really match the performance of those NetApp and EMC systems. And we looked at traditional solutions like NVDRAM to accelerate writes, or uh, big DRAM caches, or um, expensive 15k RPM disks. Um, but it turned out we were at a, just the right time and just the right place for Flash. So um, in that context, we invented something called the hybrid storage pool. So we were using Flash as a caching tier um, between disk and DRAM. Um, or, or pardon me, the other way around, between DRAM and disk. Um, and it was right between DRAM and disk in terms of cost, in terms of capacity, in terms of latency, and in terms of throughput. It was, it was remarkably right in that sweet spot, but only recently uh, the cost had previously been prohibitively high. Um, you know, we were then able to use commodity disks, 7200 RPM, so cheap disks, nearline disks, which have good enough throughput, especially when you bring you know, a dozen of them to bear on a problem. And they have great dollars per gigabyte and great watts per gigabyte. They're, um, they're, they're very dense um, and very efficient in terms of power per unit storage. Then the goal was to combine these three things into what we call uh, the hybrid storage pool, into this hybrid pool. Now what this distills into is the ZFS intent log using a SSD for write acceleration and then the L2ARC um, to extend the reach of our cache. Now, people have mentioned the L2ARC today. Um, Everyone feel comfortable giving a discourse on the L2 arc, or would anyone like a refresher? Refresher hands. A couple of hands. So um, bear with me, the folks who didn't raise your hand, and um, holler corrections if, uh, if if you feel necessary. So um, actually, let me, let me walk through a concrete example first. So this is one that we presented early on. This is pretty exciting. So on the left, in configuration A, you have um, seven 10k RPM drives. This represents the 
you know, pre-hybrid, this is the gas guzzler storage pool. Um, and on the right, you have the hybrid storage pool, right? You're, this is uh, back in the days when uh, Priuses, people thought, weren't ugly, and it got you through the carpooling quickly um, and were efficient. So on the right, we have um, one SSD, at, um, a single level cell SSD for our intent log device, and then our 80 gig MLC SSD to act as an extension to cache. And we're putting this on top of five 400 gigabyte, 4200 RPM, so really slowing down um, the the, rem, uh, pardon me, the rotations per minute. So here are the results. So um, the blue is obviously the hybrid, the orange is the traditional storage pool, and this is how it compares on a bunch of different axes. Now, we got to game this, and where we gamed it was to, to have the cost be about the same. We could have um, kind of chosen different axes. We could have spent less and had read IOPS line up, or spent more and have other things line up, but we wanted to kind of cost was the, the key metric that we were trying to compare. So we, we spent a little bit more on the hybrid, uh, but got uh, three times as many write IOPS, a bit more on the right, uh, uh, pardon me, three times as many read IOPS, a bit more on the right IOPS, um, tremendous uh, power savings, and then twice as much raw capacity. Yeah, Udo? Was this before the cost of flash went down? This is, um, this is like the, yeah, this is like 2008 um, dollars. Um, so yeah, this is um, the, you know the, the this is accounting for relatively cheap flash. Flash has dropped over time. Uh, DRAM costs have dropped over time more, um, and disk costs have dropped over time. But that, this is reflective of, of kind of 2008. I think um, relatively um, modern in terms of the, the relationship between those. So in terms of ZFS caching, uh, we talked a bit about the ARC, the adaptive replacement cache, which is uh, ZFS's primary DRAM cache. Um, you know, it's a MFU, uh, uh, most recently, is most frequently used cache. Um, lots of details on that, but it's it's pretty good. I, I don't think we've done too much tuning on it, but it's, it seems to do pretty well for most workloads. Um, the L2 arc was something that uh, Brendan Gregg developed. He mentioned that earlier when he spoke, um, when he spoke at three slides a second on all of the tools that he made. Uh, he that. It, was, it was embedded actually in every other slide. Um, so I'm sure in the back of your mind, this is a little, little message that he invented it. Um, so the l 2 was something we developed in the context, again, of that ZFS storage client. And um, what we do is we use a bunch of flash-based uh, flash devices, to SSDs, to, um, to, put, uh, to identify blocks to put proactively um, onto those devices. So, um, you know, Flash has some properties which uh, has some kind of quirky properties to it. It is very good at small reads, uh, but it doesn't really like small writes. It, it much prefers much larger writes. When you do small writes, that really hastens um, the demise of that SSD and increases something that uh, vendors call the write amplification. That means the effective amount of writing it needs to do as a response to the actual writes that you've sent it. So we're able, because we know that we're, uh, with the L2 arc, that we're uh, dealing with uh, flash media, we're able to give it these large writes. So it was great, and we were able to put some benchmarks together, um, like the one I, I put on that previous slide. The, the general case for the architecture that we would uh, recommend to users is have, you know, DRAM is X gigabytes, have your um, L2 arc be at least, you know, three times the amount of DRAM you had, um, and then try to do something um, with the working set, which was never well defined, and we kind of waved our hands about. So there, there were some problems though with the L2ARC, and there are some problems with the L2ARC, and these are the things that we've learned over time that, um, that kind of weren't evident in, in the beginning. Um, I think the biggest problem that we have with the L2ARC today is that it's not persistent. So when your box crashes, or when you lose power, or when it panics, or whatever, uh, the cache is empty. And it can take a very, very long time to warm up that cache. The way we populate the L2 arc is by scanning, or is by kind of going in a circle through each of these SSDs that you have plugged into it. Each SSD on a really sunny day gets maybe 200, 300 megabytes per second. Fast for a single device, but um, still slow when you're talking about the terabytes you might have in terms uh, of SSDs plugged into the system. So in the best case, you're gonna get about a terabyte an hour in kind of more typical examples, uh, you know, one that Brendan and I were talking about earlier, um, it took about an hour to warm up DRAM, or four hours to warm up DRAM, and 24 hours um, to warm up the L2 arc. So it takes a long time. Um, and as a gentleman was commenting, 
during the break. Um, when you've crashed, it's kind of the, the worst day of your life anyway. So then um, your system comes up in a performance degraded mode. Um, possibly other things in your environment have crashed. So every, all of these problems are exacerbated. Um, and in the meantime, you're just hoping and praying that 24 hours later, um, your cash will have kicked in and then everything gets there. So the lack of persistence is, um, is really just a killer. Um, conceptually, the L2 arc is, is very close. Um, the, the way it manages its flash media is pretty reasonable. Um, and uh, kind of the way it's integrated into the ZFS architecture is fine. Um, but there wasn't, you know, we, we kind of went maybe 80 or 90% of the way there, but never really finished the project. So there's no real way to t tune it according to the workload. So your workload might do well on the L2 arc and it might not, and it's very tough to tell a priori. It's kind of like throw in some SSDs and uh, see what it does. And maybe that wasn't enough, so throw in a couple more SSDs and we'll see if that gets better. We haven't done much, uh, or in general, the community has not done much real-world testing and much uh, real-world tuning. So we haven't taken it out into those customer environments and seen why it did well or why it did poorly and what kind of knobs um, that customers need to tune it to do it. So um, you know, L2ARC has some problems. Um, and uh, you know they're not insurmountable, but they are certainly obstacles for deploying it. The bigger problem is that uh, the, the landscape is changing, and uh, what was true in 2007, 2008 is not necessarily true today. So DRAM prices have experienced a really remarkable drop. Um, I was looking earlier, and um, I think at, you know, in 2007, 2008, the, the price of uh, NAND DRAM was about kind of a 10, 15x difference. Now it's about a four or five x difference. So it's um, it's come down very, very significantly. So. And, and further, you can make, build out these big systems. Um, IBM has a system that you can go to, I think, four terabytes of DRM. Uh, I, I might be off by that, but I'm, I'm not off by much. So you can make these very large um, memory systems, and they're relatively economical to put together because of that drop in DRM prices. I'm not saying they're cheap, like you and I aren't going to put them in our basements, but um, you know, our rich employers or various of the rich employers might. Um, and NAND is getting to be a harder medium to deal with. Um, so the endurance is going down um, and the performance is going down as the lithography is getting smaller and the price is, is dropping. So um, if I throw out terms like SLC, MLC, TLC, you'll know what these mean? Okay, a couple of hands. So the, uh, SLC means single level cell flash. That's what your original iPod, or your first generation flash iPod was based on. Um, and that's what people talk about enterprise flash, they're talking about single level cell. That means each, um, each effect, uh, floating gate transistor has a single bit that it's, that it's storing in there. Um, the, as that became uh, kind of too expensive, they came up with ways of putting multiple cells on there. Uh, so MLC typically stores, uh, it means multiple level cell flash, that stores um, two bits per cell. Now, I don't know what TLC stands for. Yeah, but really, channel. It really, it really, <laughs> it really hurts me. It stands for triple level cell. It, of course, there are eight levels on a three, like to store three values, but they call it triple level cell. I, I, I couldn't give a presentation without rambling on about this for just a few seconds, thanks for the group therapy. Um, <laughs> but so yeah, TLC stores eight bits per cell, maybe it's ELC sounds stupid or something, um, and it stores three bits per cell. But they have um, just increasingly short lives. So back in uh, 2004, when again, NAND was uh, very, very expensive, you could expect to get a million write array cycles. A million is effectively infinity, right? You're not going to burn through it, especially when you have enough uh, enough capacity. Um, you know, in uh, 2008, you could get reliably 30,000 write array cycles um, off of MLC. Today, uh, MLC they're quoting numbers like 10,000 write array cycles, and um, some of the early revs of triple level cell. It was something like 100 write array cycles. So that's how many times you can program a given cell. So really, not very much. Now, these benchmarks, the, all of those metrics are a little bit skewed and kind of assume a naive implementation um, of, the, of the SSD, for example. It's like, um, how many times can you write to it and then um, store data for a year or something? Whereas um, some people are getting fancy and they're saying, well, I'll, I won't store it for a year, I'll proactively go in and make sure I refresh the data periodically so that um, that, that lets them extend the life of it. But it's getting much, much harder. 
We're also running into severe limitations of just the physics of it. So in 2008, we were dealing with 32 nanometer flash, and in fact, the sun we had a, a kind of moderate crisis because our vendor was stopping was stopping their fab line on the 32 nanometer flash, um, and the next kind of nand down was was significantly crappier. Today, uh, we're dealing with 19 nanometer flash, and um, people wonder if you can even get below kind of 13, 12, 11 nanometers. Whether we're going to just go run out of road and that will be it for flash. Uh, the problem is that the, um, the physics of flash are that you have this floating gate which stores um, electrons on it. And at some point, you have so few electrons that uh, you can't actually read and write values to it. It just becomes uh, you know, too few electrons, too little charge to measure. So flash is becoming a kind of very difficult place. Um, it's, um, you know, there, there are questions about how much you know, whether, whether flash as space has legs over the next five or 10 years. Um, and then SSDs are becoming crazy complicated in terms of what they're doing in there. And then that makes it all the more difficult for pieces of software like the L2R to operate on top of this. All right, so this has been basically a doom and gloom talk. Uh, but, you know, what can you do today about this? So for all the pessimism around the L2R, it actually can help. and. Um, I know that in 2010, for example, I was getting kind of um, disappointed by the L2R. We had had high hopes for it, and um, we'd seen it kind of perverted in our marketing and kind of ineffective. But then I, I went to a couple of customers and you know pulled up analytics and saw uh, this is with the ZFS storage clients and saw that um, their L2R hit rate was non-zero. So it's like, all right, they're getting some benefit out. So um, and they're like, yeah, it works great for us. We're glad we paid for it. Okay, great. I know you paid twenty thousand dollars for it. So that's Good, good for me. Um, so uh, SSDs really can help you here, and uh, the L2R can be effective. I think, um, you know, and, and Richard just showed us some good ways of kind of measuring the potential impact, um, but I'd say that make sure you try before you go all in for it, because there, there's some real nuances, and if it doesn't kind of suit your workload well, it's very difficult to tune, or in some cases impossible to really tune it. There are no real knobs and, and tough ways to measure. Um, and the performance can just be um, tough to predict, as I said. So make sure you get there and don't run some pretend workload, run your real workload, um, and give it enough time to warm up. Uh, that said, L2R is awesome. So um, if you want to increase the performance of your, of, your, uh, of your file system, think about adding more DRAM onto that system. Um, it can be just as cost effective, I think, in some cases, as, as adding more L2R. Um, but now for ZFS. Um, in order to make the L2R viable, we, we need to do more work on that. And um, there are some companies here that are betting their, company, their businesses on ZFS, um, and I say it's incumbent on them to, to really take up the mantle and, and move forward with, with the L2R if they're using it. So there's lots of performance work we need to do. We need to get um, out and um, run on real workloads and uh, burn through those cases and make sure that the L2R is doing the right thing um, and, and suiting those, uh, using, pardon me, well suited for those use cases. Also, we need uh, ways to collect coherent data. Um, you know, Brendan gave us, uh, I think he's claimed 12, but I think I counted 100 different ways of measuring ZFS. We need good ways of measuring L2R behavior, because the L2R behavior is quirky, and then knobs that we can turn in order to adjust how it's working on our systems. Those don't exist today, uh, but they're stuff that we need to go do. So um, to summarize, lots of pessimism, a little optimism, and then next steps. Um, any questions for me about L2R or Flash or uh, anything in that domain? Yeah. You haven't said anything about, about, much about Zill. Yeah, Zill's great. So you throw an SSD in it, and and it's and it's terrific. And uh, you know the problem, the biggest problem we have. Uh, yeah, pardon me for for kind of just skimming over that. Um, so the Zill is the ZFS intent log. You can have a separate intent log device, uh, a um, external accelerator or an extra accelerator. So um, we threw an SSD in there at, in the ZFS storage clients. Many other um, folks have done very similar things and saw a tremendous benefit. The especially neat thing about using SSDs as your separate intent log device um, is that you don't need too much of it. In fact, we never saw our utilization our, of, of the capacity of that go above, I think, 10 or 16 terabytes. Terabytes? Gigabytes, excuse me. Um, so, in fact, uh, this company STEC, they're, they're on the showroom floor. Um, they, uh, you know, we, we asked them to make a um, SSD, which wasn't flash, 
but was just um, DRAM with some supercapacitors. And they needed so much supercapacitance, they needed to like router um, like holes in the lid so that the, the, the super caps could just poke out a little bit. If you go down to the showroom floor, you'll really see what I'm talking about. But those are eight gig devices, which are great. Um, accelerators for the Zelle, I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've seen them. Um, but yeah, flash is great there. I think the only concern I have is the number of write array cycles. Um, but with um, relatively high endurance SSDs, you'll be fine. Or just um, you know, mirror them and treat them as basically disposable entities. Because they'll wear out eventually, but uh, as long as you mirror it, then you'll be fine. Yeah. Are you seeing any uh, performance uh, kind of fall offs, or are you using um, something like a Sandforce with um, brain amplification um, concerns in the controller versus something that just writes straight to the flash? So, a uh, question about um, the the difference between if you're writing to an SSD versus writing straight to NAND. I don't know that you can actually. I don't know of any devices you can buy today where you're writing directly to NAND. No, no, so. I, don't, I don't mean that. I mean, like the Sandforce ones, they actually have the, the write amplification kind of built in to their ASIC essentially, so that it reduces the total amount of data being written directly to NAND as opposed to something like an Intel controller that doesn't do write amplification. And uh, I think maybe you mean write buffering? Yeah, so, so a lot of these SSDs have a buffer sitting in front, so they'll, they'll kind of minimize the write amplification. Uh, write amplification meaning if I, if I do a write of 8K, how much data actually gets written to the uh, underlying NAND. So all, all, all SSDs have potentially some level of write amplification depending on kind of the order in which you write things. But you're right, a lot of SSDs have a write buffer sitting in front of that, which will minimize the amount of write amplification because they'll kind of grab a big chunk, they'll wait for a big chunk of data to accumulate, kind of a mini ZFS. They have their own little ZFS intent log sitting on that device, which they'll then blast out. Um, and that can certainly help. So paying for a more expensive SSD has some of those enterprise class features. Um, you know, the, the, that's where the economics of the L2 arc, though, fall apart. Um, the, the L2R was really designed around cheap NAND. So if you start, and, and again, um, if you start buying enterprise class SSDs, then those are um, kind of no cheaper than the DRAM alternatives. So they're not, they're not, and it's not, we don't treat it as persistent. So there's very little benefit unless you're literally out of, of DIMM slots on your system. Um, but yeah, for, for, for example, for Zill devices, getting an expensive SSD that has a bunch of NV DRAM sitting on there is, is a reasonable idea. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think there are any performance improvements that could be made to the Zill implementation? Do I think there are performance uh, improvements that can be made to the Zill? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so George is going to be talking later. And uh, George, do you just want to talk about that answer now? Yeah, so there, there are some things in synchronous code path um, that can be improved. Uh, I don't have any slides on it, but we can definitely you know, discuss it. Uh, one of the big things that we've seen primarily on the, on the synchronous code path is that you can get into these re-during uh, allocation cycles. So you end up leaving a lot of performance on the, on the floor because you've effectively had to go off to read a bunch of blocks in order to you know, satisfy this you know, write that you want very low latency on. So we're making some changes there to effectively eliminate that when you're coming in, not only through the synchronous code path, but we're also wanting to do it for the async write code path as well. So um, one thing that I was wondering about is that uh, we could do something like creating the parallelism of the go write. Because right now, you're only allowed to have one writer to a cell, even if it happened to be flat. Yeah, it is possible to actually do some of that work. Where, like today, we try to cache out couple sets of like yeah, we'll batches. Yeah, you get kind of this wavy effect. Yeah, I'd ask, uh, interesting conversation, but I'd ask you guys to take it offline. Yeah. There's going to be lots of, and, and best had over, over beer, I imagine. Yeah, question way in the back. So I was looking at uh, effectively, effectively was the L2 arc a while ago, and I couldn't really see it was helping much, but the disks were pretty cheap. And then I looked at the cost of RAM, and I was thinking, well, I need a terabyte of RAM in a box right now pretty cheaply. And at this point, I'm thinking I'm going to buy a box with a terabyte of RAM and see what happens. Yeah, we just bought a box with a terabyte of RAM to, to see what happens as well. I was really surprised how, you know. Yeah. 
Um, when you get to a terabyte of RAM, uh, one thing you'll find out is the some of the algorithms in the art don't scale. Uh, actually, you'll see that at about 100 gigs. So uh, more work we need to do together. Good, and that's why we got the terabyte of RAM box. <laughs> There's also a question on the stream. Okay. Any experiences or thoughts with battery backed up RAM drives? Um, where's Chris? George. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I love battery backed up. Chris, did you ask that question on the stream? Because you can just go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would never ask. <laughs> yeah, the, the battery backed up RAM drives are great. So, uh, that's just a, a kind of NVD RAM that we'd use you know, uh, as a Zill device. Um, it's a great accelerator. You know, one of the reasons why um, the and and you know what I was alluding to with that S Tech part. That's uh, a particular one that uses flash or, or DRAM and supercaps, but DRAM and batteries or DRAM and other external power sources are other great alternatives. Um, and uh, you know, NVDRAM is particularly fast. Uh, SSDs tend to be a little cheaper and more accessible, um, and have less quirky failure modes like the batteries exploding and stuff like that, but, um, you know, pick your poison. Um, as far as, like, you were talking about the physics of, of Flash starting to become a problem with the, the um, slog, is, is there something, because the writes don't live on the slog for very long, if at all, is there anything that you can, you can do with the, because you know it, it doesn't need to stay there for days, months, years, it's seconds. Yeah, so uh, the question is, you know, the, the writes don't live in the slog too long, so is there a way we can take advantage of that? And, and that's true except for when you need the data in the slog. So then you unplug your box and you put it in a truck and move it somewhere, you need the data to live for as long as it lived. But you're right, typically you only need the, the data in the slog to exist for, um, you know, until you know, the power pin goes high again. Um, so, or, or until ZFS uh, comes back online after a reboot. So you're right. Um, I think in a lot of these cases, even these SSDs that um, you know have very few write array cycles are um, potentially going to be okay because um, the longevity that they have associated with the, their end of life is still going to be sufficient. But so it's also small, and the capacities are huge, so you're massively over provisioned once you slice the SSD. That's true. And yeah, it's write array. It's how many cycles you have over the, the the scope of the entire device. So if you get like a one terabyte SSD, then you know you multiply the number of write array cycles times that whole thing, and then divide by your your write activity. Yeah. So I was thinking about you're saying sparse collecting your moral data. Uh, I think right now it's really difficult. Like there are a bunch of different scripts, different tools. Like, uh, I know a lot of us are really especially for building bigger systems. It would be interesting to see if we come up with something that's more than standardized, like take a bunch of data stuff and put it together into some one kind of thing that we could, a lot of us could use and you know, give us kind of a common set of results. Yeah. So this is a suggestion for standardization, both of data collection and of benchmark uh, execution and stuff. I say absolutely. Um, you know, right now I work for a company that isn't particularly interested in the L2R. So. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the right person to talk to on that. I agree with you. I think there are other folks in the audience and, and kind of who will be here, be here this evening who will be perhaps more receptive to your play, but I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, let's talk. All right, great. Thanks, everyone.